The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm just going to go very quickly through the World Economic Forum. I basically, I only wanted you all to glance at this and get an idea of it because what it's in here for is to show that, you know, we're not the only ones trying to think about innovation factors, right? They are trying to figure out what these factors are as they assess different national economies. They have a whole comp global competitiveness rating system, which they get out every other year. So in 2015, 2016, as you saw, Switzerland was number one, Singapore number two, and the U.S. was number three in their rating. And then they have a whole series of elements that they consider in their global competitiveness analysis. So they look at what they call factor-driven economies, and the pillars there are institutions and infrastructure and macroeconomic environment and, you know, and, and actually early stage education as a pillar in health. And then efficiency-driven economies, they call them. That's higher education, that's market efficiency for goods, that's labor market efficiency, that's financial market developments, technology readiness, and so forth. And then innovation-driven economies, business sophistication and innovation capability. So they have a very different mix here. I just wanted to throw in kind of a comparative way of other people looking at the problems that we're talking about and the kind of pillars that they come about and how they sort different kind of world economies and organize them. Uh, but a lot of these factors we've just been, we've just been talking about. Um, kind of the, the core, I think, of what, to take, what the takeaway is from, uh, from this study. And let me get, uh, you also had Rycroft, Lily, as well, right? So why don't I get Rycroft out on the table, too? Um, that's Bob Rycroft and, and Cash. Um, they did this piece back in 1999, and I'm, I'm leading into how do you look at some of these more indirect innovation factors, right? Because they they remain important, and we're just going to pick three, right? And you know they're looking at a kind of an element of innovation organization, which I think is a core factor, but they're talking about kind of a sub piece of it, this kind of networking theory of innovation organization. I think it's it's an intriguing piece. Um, they argue that we are now at a stage in the world economy that complex technologies drive the economy. So with complex technologies, the lone inventor in the garage working solo, that's a myth. That doesn't work anymore, right? Because the, the technologies that lead to innovation are just too complex, they argue. So that means that the traditional focus of US technology policy on R&D at particular institutions and in open markets, that's, that's not necessarily right anymore, they argue. So they say that a much more self-conscious networked learning environment is actually key. And what does that mean? Well, complex technologies we know dominate world exports. Um, 82% in 1995 compared to, you know, 43% in 1970. Um, the rise in complex products means a rise in complex organizational models that goes with it. Um, the number of corporate alliances, corporate interrelationships, the connectedness of the actors becomes all that much more critical when the dominant products are complex technology based. So as product complexity grows, the need for innovative networks grows. And technological process progress in this phase really requires that network learning, integrating, and applying a whole wide variety of new science and technology knowledge and know-how, that now becomes key. Gee whiz, you know, we're not organized around that. If these guys are right, We've got an innovation system that's organized on a much earlier idea of how technologies evolve. It doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of the complexity 
and the fact that the complexity drives much more complex organizational system, which includes networking, they argue. So they, they cite George Brown, who was a great former chairman of the House Science Committee, on the point that neglect of the processes of knowledge and their diffusion and application needs to be a core concern of the innovation system. And Brown is talking about particularly at the governmental level, the governmental kind of role here. There's new kinds of learning that need to take place and need to be organized around if you're going to have this kind of learning network system. So a shared network learning, which cuts across a series of institutions, institutional engineering that brings in other parts of the systems, like the regulatory side, into the network. Um, there's got to be a whole evaluation and what they call co-evaluation between complex organizations and the technologies that they're developing. So learning by doing, learning by using, learning from scientific and technology advances, learning from spillovers, learning from interaction. They argue that these are whole new features of learning that need to occur that aren't necessarily accounted for in our current learning systems. So they need to be changed to really accommodate the kind of new realities of the way in which innovation is going to have to get organized. So that's their, that's their proposition. I thought it was just kind of a fun read. It tells us a little more about the determinism piece that we were talking about earlier. Complex technologies demand new organizational models. And if Nelson is right, innovation organization really amounts to a core direct innovation factor then you know, stuff like what Rycroft and Cash are proposing you know, becomes significant in the process. Lily, it's all yours. That was speedy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go high speed for the rest of the class. First, I'll point out a couple of things that have been hit about the World Economic Forum 2015-16 um, report. Uh, they do mention that after the global economic crisis of 2008, economies are experiencing increased growth again. Um, and actually, in the United States, we're experiencing the lowest unemployment rate since 2008. However, global economies are projected to have slower rates of economic growth um, than they did pre-housing or global economic crisis of 2008. Um, and so that sort of brought me to a question. Uh, there was a question for a couple of, of, of the rest of you as well, which is, why is it not enough, or, or is it enough, for growth rates to be positive and slow and steady. So what's the, what is the magic thing that happens between a growth rate of about, what are we at, 1.8%? Yeah, around two. And, and about 3%, which seems to be more of a, an optimistic atmosphere. So what is, what's going on in that 1%? Um, and do we need to maybe post, for the next few years, post-2008 crisis, global economy struggling, do we need to readjust ourselves to adapt to a lower rate of economic growth? So in the report, I remember that they had mentioned uh, that we should be trying to push further and try to keep our growth, uh, to try to make it faster. But when I was reading it, I, was, I felt like, uh, well, maybe that extremely high growth rate was emphasized for the first part of it, anyway. So, at least from what I see, maybe we should just try to adapt to what we have now and just uh, keep things more steady, then we'll have fewer of these costs. But if we do that, we'll be less intense. So like kind of stay on that more gradual slope rather than the steep one that bubbles out and then hits that? Yeah. So let me take that on for a minute. Because if technological and related innovation is the dominant causative factor of growth, and your societal well-being depends upon your ability to have that growth and to spread that well-being across the society, then if we're stuck at a 1.8, a 2% growth rate, isn't that going to be an enduring, disruptive problem in the society? Aren't we going to be a lot better off if we could push that up to 3 Why? Is it emotional? Is it like the stock market that's in Driven. Is that what's going on there? Well, if we've got a deep problem of economic income inequality at this point, 
an economic growth rate helps a lot in dealing with that. It's much more problematic to deal with that with a low growth rate, for example. So this kind of barbell effect that we've got in the society of a growing upper middle class and then a thinning middle and a growing lower end services, lower paid services sector, which the middle is being pushed into, gets a lot harder to fix that unless you've got a stronger growth rate, I'd argue. I understand your point. How much stuff do we really need, right? You know, how many things do we actually have to have, right? Is there a whole new way of kind of organizing the society? Um, so you're making an interesting underlying point, I think, Max. Um, and there's also the competitive side, Martha. Um, competitive piece of we're supposed to be beating or, you know, other countries and we need those innovation ways if we're going to keep ownership of technologies. Although in this more globalized world, I mean, we're all really connected, which is why the housing crisis that really was local here affected everyone. Yes. On the other hand, we definitely, um, well, we see ourselves as leaders compared to other countries. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And I think that there's a real argument that to be made that if we don't, if we're not the ones to do the discovery around energy or whatever, others will. Um, and the gains are substantial. A first mover advantage is substantial. But I guess I would say that it's a good question of like how much do we really need to consume, you know? Or perhaps it's not necessarily the 1.8% that's the problem. It's the one-two punch of sort of the dot-com, our, our technological wave, our bubble bursting, and we're immediately after that having also a global economic crisis um, that's you know, <laughs> compounded each other. But one of your points brought, uh, brought up another question that someone made, and that is what do, do we... Have we identified, either within the United States or internationally, what could be our next innovative wave? Um, and is it the same for the United States as, as it is for the rest of the world? Or have we even identified it, or do we think we know what it is yet? The, the next wave is probably going to be biotech as well. Because you know? <laughs> uh, what, what's happening with biotech is that uh, there's this thing called Moore's Law, well, um, which is in certain things like every year. I think every 18 months you double your capabilities, or a lot of bioengineering, the ability to, to, to sequence, um, and also write DNA, they got much, much cheaper. Sequencing, I forget how fast it is. Um, you might be able to Google it. I forget what the name is. That's what I do. Uh, the Human Genome Project was over 10 years and cost billions of dollars, and now I can sequence a couple hundred genomes for a few thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's the, the, those kind of uh, exponential economics is really what drives the next wave. Um, but that's a lot like uh, IT. Energy would probably be able to, somebody figures some key thing out and it's just like all in, go ahead. Because of the nature of that market. Because of fusion and stuff like that. So if you can figure out a way to True, but then I think it's not the history of energy technology. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, yeah. something like, for example, the light bulb. Yeah, sure, we figured out the light bulb. Edison figured out the light bulb, but then on top of that, there was all the infrastructure and moving over to that technology that really. Uh, spilled over. So, Lily, why don't we go to Rycroft and Cash? Uh, it was summarized by Bill, and I just wanted to bring attention to a couple of questions about Rycroft and Cash. Um, so, one was a Chloe's question how, how do you strike a proper balance, or can we identify a proper balance between encouraging competitive RD? inside a single industry or field, um, and in, or encouraging this collective learning that Red Crop and Cash say is so important. And I also have a similar question is, is it possible to foster networking and shared learning while protecting profits and patents? Which I think is exactly what you're saying. So do we, yeah. Yeah, so, well, not always considered the most innovative field, the oil and gas sector has actually come up with interesting ways to do shared learning, these like joint industry projects where they have like third party labs run projects and companies will buy into them and then they all share the knowledge of like information that has collective good to them. And I've always thought it's interesting that you don't see that in that many other industries, but it seems like it has a lot of potential to be useful um, if you like, find these confidenti confidentiality agreements and you recognize that we all benefit from understanding this better. 
seems like it could be widely applicable. I think one thing to note about that is that like oil and gas is a pretty like mature sort of industry. And like say take biotech, there's a ton of like startups and new companies. Like for example, the new like IP battle over the CRISPR Cas9 mm -hmm. technology that's huge because there's so many different companies, like five or six, being spawned out of like these core ideas and these like IP technologies that they're licensing from essentially two different entities. And like whether whoever gets those rights, they'd have to pay money to. So I think it makes sense, like yeah, for kind of shared knowledge on a more mature level. Mm -hmm. But um, for you know early technologies and early companies, it's hard to say because you, know, you know you're still trying to protect your market share and kind of enter the market that way. Mm -hmm. Good you Do you do? You, how do you feel like that might be impacted by international science can kind of progress? Mm, yeah, I feel like, um, like you, international kind of... I guess, so, I probably should have framed that a little bit better. Um, I guess in, I think in the context of CRISPR technologies, it's primarily domestic, right? Like, it's, it's really Berkeley and MIT who are really fighting for the patent. So, in that instance, what do you think, in terms of this particular technology, is the role in international competition, or is this a conflict that can be resolved domestically in another sort of more innovative way that does not involve patenting? So I, I think that's too much. the fight also kind of extends to Europe, just because there has been some patents filed there. I don't know like too much about the legal stuff necessarily, but um, I think especially since CRISPR is kind of like a new frontier for biotech and like medical technologies to really get into the genome editing and could be really applicable to a whole bunch of different subfields and applications that actually a lot of labs are working on here and elsewhere. So I think it's also kind of an international fight just because companies abroad, I'm sure, like Germany and other big biotech companies there are probably interested in probably working on them like right now. Right, and just to add a point to this IP point that you all have been raising. So in our panoply of direct and indirect innovation factors, this whole world of intellectual property rights is indirect, but we can all see how potentially significant it could be. In other words, it's not gonna fundamentally affect your ability to undertake the innovation itself, but it sure may affect your ability to realize gains off of it. Okay, I asked a quick question about the uh you mentioned the, the advantage of a first mover. Uh, uh, and so in uh, Nelson, he was saying that the first firm doesn't necessarily get most of the economic rent. And I, I just, to me intuitively, especially for something like energy, where maybe the first person and you're setting up a bunch of nuclear plants, you get stuck with outdated infrastructure and you can't change that. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? I, Matt, I agree with you. I think the distinction here and I probably should have been more explicit, but the first mover advantage in launching an innovation wave, in other words, a national or regional advantage for the benefiting economy, I think is very real. I think you know the point you made that the first mover advantage for a particular firm may be much more questionable. Others may see what they're doing and be able to make improvements and bring those out more rapidly than the initial firm that's kind of locked into its initial approach. And we see, we see in many cases with new inventions that bring on innovation advances, we can certainly see firms that have a first mover advantage. We can also see second movers that are able to capture that. So I think it's a more complex question at the company level, but I think it's clearer at the regional economy, national economy kind of level. So I would argue that the US by building strong innovation capacity and its ability to lead most of the innovation waves um, of the second half of the 20th century, that was a huge advantage. That was a huge gain. Um, so no sooner did the US miss the quality manufacturing wave to Japan, uh, 70s and 80s, but it came right back with the IT innovation wave in the 90s, which Japan missed. So when you put your economy at the edge of the frontier, right, leadership of the frontier, capturing those innovation ways becomes pretty important. But I digress, Lily.
I'll, we have 45 minutes total left, which would be 15 for each of his. <laughs> Why don't you give us a closing thought? Why don't you give us a closing thought on Rycroft and Cash? Okay. Um, yeah, I thought they needed to be more explicit with what they were actually saying. As someone who did, doesn't come from an economics background, uh, it was a little, the terminology was hard for me to address. All this learning by doing was a little too squishy. Yeah, exactly. Right. You need a more exact my, portrait. My terms define. Got it. OK, well, I think that's a valid critique. All right, so I'm going to race through the next couple, which, Martina, I think you've got. Um, this is Eagles Millsburg. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But again, it's one of these indirect factors that turns out to you know, have some significance here. His point is, the old economy was a world of tangible assets. What counted were your plant, your equipment, your land, your physical resources, your product inventory, your infrastructure support system, physical stuff. In the 21st century of a new economy, intellectual and intangible assets, those are key, right? So we have a wonderful 19th century accounting system. It's really, it's wonderful. It can really value the old economy. It really can't value the new economy, right? And we, we've been discussing this whole problem with the ability to get capital on the advances. If you've got an accounting system that can't value true value in the new economy, then of course you're going to have a serious problem getting capital funding available, right? So here's an indirect thing, you know, the accounting system, that turns out to have a fairly significant effect. So the inability to measure intangibles undermines the willingness of firms to invest in innovation because they can't really score it and get gains from it. And it limits the investment flow into innovation as a result. So, and he argues, paints a picture of how this intangible process, you know, came about and arguing that by the late 90s, um, there was, about, in looking at the U.S. economy overall, there was about $1.1 trillion invested in intangible assets in the manufacturing sector. In that same sector, there was a trillion dollars in combined in R&D, business processes, and software, more, much more intangible. Um, and intangible capital, he argues, became 82% of U U.S. firms' market value, just an overwhelming portion of their market value. So we need new metrics for how firms invest in these qualitative innovation factors so that we can drive investment in an efficient way into the right places. And we just don't have them. We only measure a couple of things. We measure total company R&D investment, that gets reported on you know, quarterly reports, and we get company patent filings, that gets revealed as well. But then all this other stuff, and maybe these aren't the right factors, maybe some of them are completely wrong, but there's a whole set of other potential measures that we don't even ask for, right? Or even think about how they could be best organized. So that's Eagle's you know, core idea here. You know, that's why you need to get some of these indirect innovation factors right along with the direct ones. Another example, um, this was you know, Udayan Gupta's early book on venture capital, right? Kind of an early history of venture capital, came out in 2000. Um, venture capital by 1999 had grown from, three, by, grown from 3 billion at the beginning of the decade to 30 billion. Now venture capital in 2015 was 60 billion, okay? So venture capital was built on the idea that introducing new technologies delivers much higher investor returns. Remember that chart that one of you cleverly asked me how many years it covered? Was that, that was Martin? Um, you know, this is, he's saying the same thing. In other words, if you can capture the gains of radical investment, they can be really big. Um, and that's what the venture capital sector is organized around. And he notes this interesting history Right, so we're in one of the capitals of venture capital. We're in the place that originated it. Um, the East Coast model originally 
was much more focused on what we would call today financial engineering. You know, tax benefits, short-term returns, that conceptual framework um, kind of dominated the early Boston venture capital model. The West Coast developed a very different model around science and technology driven um, growth in places like Sand Hill Road and Silicon Valley. It's still its capital. So now those distinctions have pretty much disappeared. Both sides are on the same game. Um, and you include within the term of venture capital, some people include a much broader phraseology, including angel investors, corporate, inve corporate venture firms, uh, foundation venture firms, sometimes university endowment funds that go to, the, to a venture kind of purpose. So it's a bigger landscape than it was you know, at the early stages. Um, but the East Coast model, which did things like late stage buyouts, turnarounds, roll-ups, consolidations, in addition to early stage venture, that's now prevalent, frankly, in both the East Coast and West Coast models. So the two sides have kind of merged. The originator of the venture capital idea was General George Dorio, who was a World War II general, helped in the organization of industry in Europe um, during World War II and following it. So a remarkable figure. He taught at the Harvard Business School, but he's the one who kind of saw this potential gain from innovation-based growth. And the West Coast model really was kind of a maverick model. It was very high risk investment based on quite unproven technologies. And that turned out to be the right model, right? The problem is we're not frankly doing enough of that in enough areas. We'll get to that in another point in class. So that's the venture capital story. And let me just close and then we'll have some dialogue that Martine will lead. Um, this is Charles Schultz, who was you know, quite a famous economist uh, he was budget director for Lyndon Johnson and he, for Jimmy Carter, who was head of the Council of Economic Advisors, very highly thought of uh, economist from Minnesota, deep historical role in governmental policy making. He's taking a look at the debate, which we'll actually get into in our next class, about what's going on with Japan's economy of the 70s and 80s, where they're bringing on this new innovation wave of quality manufacturing. And the U.S. is trying to figure out how to respond, right? And he's talking about the political debate, much as we were talking about the political debate that's going on now, he was talking about the current political debate of that time, right? When he writes this in 1983. And there was a big debate over U.S. competitiveness. There was a deep concern that the U.S. was, guess what, deindustrializing. Sound familiar? Uh, that essential U.S. heavy industry was in decline. And the 80s concern was that the US may have been at the cutting edge of technology advance, but it was not implementing those technology advances. Whereas by comparison, the US perception of the time was that they had a very activist governmental kind of role, an interventionist governmental kind of role that's identifying technological winners and moving those right into implementation. So in a way, Martine, it's like the, the point you were raising earlier, don't just do sculptures, do buildings. Japan was deep into the building phase. The US was still at the sculpture phase. Um, so, and its, it's principal arm for doing this was METI, um, and, which is now called METI, but still very prevalent, but much less interventionist now um, than it was back, or considerably less interventionist now than it was back in the 70s and 80s. What proposals are the parties coming up with on how to deal with this? Well, here's what the Democrats were up to. They decided there should be an industrial development bank. It would, just like in Japan, pick winners. And, heaven forbid, it would protect losers, right? So no one would have to lose, jobs would be protected and so forth. And yet they would also select you know, winning new areas to, to get investment. Um, and it would work to rehab failing major industries, upgrade them, uh, protect their workforces, but also attempt on working on a new labor agreement uh, between management and labor to get labor cost cuts that would help fund the restoration of these sectors. That was the Democrats' idea, right? Um, the Republican idea was to, you guessed it, support reductions in marginal tax rates. 
right? Um, Schultz is very concerned about this idea. His concern is that the U.S. government is not able to select a winning industrial structure. This is just not a good job for government to be doing. It will not be good at this. The regional politics, the state politics are just so powerful that it's going to unglue the government's ability to kind of pick a winning technology sector and ride with it. It's going to have to be dispersed. Everybody's going to have to have gains. Jobs are going to have to be located all over the place. Just not something that's going to be supported well. That the political system really cannot efficiently choose between individual firms and particular regions for getting support at this stage of the industrial process. So fine to support R&D, but when it comes closer, much further down the pipeline and you're actually picking industrial winners, that's a really tricky political process he warns us about. So a lot of this class, as you all were driving us towards today, is going to be what is the governmental role, right? So Schultz stands as a warning about the political imperfections of government, the political difficulties of government in undertaking an interventionist role. Um, so it's, I think that's probably a pretty good summary. I'll skip the rest of Schultz, but that's, that's really his core idea is to tell us a cautionary tale about what the governmental role is going to be, that the sheer massive weight of politics is not going to necessarily drive optimal technology decision making. Now, Martin, let me turn it over to you and let's go through these three. So first, eagles, and then maybe do a couple of questions on that and say some points, and then let's do um, Gupta on the venture capital structure. Do I just do like a general overview? Yeah, let's let's have an overview, and you know, and we'll start with Millsburgs, okay. and then go into a couple of questions. So the objective is to increase incentive for private sector to pursue long-term innovation strategies and investments, um, but that can be pretty difficult to do. Um, market valuations are driven by economic conditions, uh, demand, potential market size, and profits, um, various entry competitors, and introduction of alternatives and substitutes. Um, but intangible assets um, most likely will determine the long-term success of a company. And this has to do a lot with their corporate strategy. Um, most likely, the companies that we see that are successful, successful today, that are going to be successful 100 years from now, will be doing the same thing. Um, like an easy example would be if you look at like Monsanto originally, they're a chemical company, and now they're focusing on agriculture. So, in order to fuel these long term innovation strategies, it's on, on these things that are hard to measure. Um, and so, a couple questions that were left up were. What innovation trends and sectors represent the most promising growth areas for VCs in the next 10 years? Oh, okay. Um, what can incentivize a shift to long term intrinsic value creation compared to short term objectives? Does anybody also, like, if anybody has any interesting insights or experiences with this kind of paper, um, just feel free to check it out. Think about particularly the old accounting system, um, which is kind of measuring money flows, um, financial engineering, which is kind of important. Uh, I think that might have been easy. I guess it was easy, and it still is easy. I probably think of it as easy because we were doing it and have done it for so long. Um, but I think particularly valuing these intangibles is something that we see is going to create all this growth. And then I don't know if there's any... Um, Management studies are kind of behavioral things uh, that we can take a look at. How are we doing at these intangibles? Because um, these intangibles seem like something like uh, you know it when you see it, but you might not be able to you know kind of put bounds on it or put um, a number on it. And I feel like it's because we haven't tried. Um, and so I don't know if there have been any efforts um, sustained or even accepted uh, or even kind of argued over to like start valuing these intangible things because we can complain all we want uh, about how we can't measure the intangibles to do it. So Rashid, a very interesting point. And there's been a, a significant amount of work in Britain, actually, to try and figure out me measurement systems 
for these intangibles, these kind of know-how based assets. Um, and then following from that work in the EU on trying to measure these. Interestingly, we really haven't done much in the US on this, as crucial as it is. Because I think it's really important to have some sort of standardized way to measure this, because otherwise it all comes down to like trust between companies and inventors, or and investors, and companies will always have an incentive to overstate what their intangible assets are, and because they're intangible, it's harder to prove what, whether they're being honest or not, so there needs some sort of standardization process. On the other end, like from an investing standpoint, isn't the fact that like value, valuing like intangibles and things like IP the main reason why there could be like hidden value or kind of mispricing based on because not everyone has a good idea of how to price these things. That's how they can find like sort of an edge based off like other companies that might not have the same insight. I feel like that might be one of the reasons why um, there hasn't been a push to kind of, I don't know, standardize how to quantify those, not only because it's difficult to, especially like, I think he brought up like customer satisfaction. I feel like that's really hard to figure out a way to come up with a metric to say, oh, this customer satisfaction is higher than this one. I feel like it'd be difficult, but interesting to come up with a system. I was also curious whether he's talking about a system that's applicable to companies in different industries or just companies within like the same industry. Like, are you looking at Dropbox and Box or are you looking at like Dropbox and Facebook? Like, should you, can you actually compare like across, not this, even like the same industry, but across like applications even? Another interesting question to add on to that is why are we treating intellectual property for different industries the same? Um, so I think the lifetime of a patent is around 20 years. And so why is it that something that is really easy, well, relatively easy to do, that you could um, tie on as a patent for intellect, for IT, like for a Facebook, um, where it's very quick to capture value relatively to other industries versus like energy, where it might take you years and years of research to do it. And then even to execute 20 years is a short time frame because it might take you 10 years to negotiate where you're going to put it, right, if you're doing like a reactor system. So by the time you kind of get started, um, that's, there's incentives there to not really focus on those industries. So maybe, or even biotech, where I think it's around a billion to two billion dollars to create a drug. Um, why aren't there longer intellectual property cycles for those industries in order to incentivize more growth in those areas? So. I mean, the 20 year thing is a general, uh, general framework, but there is a uh, pharmaceutical, but there are patent laws that will um, extend the lifetime of your patent to compensate for some of the R&D time. But they, they do exist. When we talk about, when we do a class on the life science, health science kind of case study, we'll get a lot, we'll get deeply into this whole question about patent term and could you start to vary patent term and to encourage small market drugs, third world disease drugs, which wouldn't ordinarily come about through the system where you're right, our team, we've got to capture a billion eight just in upfront in order to bring a drug to market. Uh, does anybody have any interesting thoughts on this piece? Yes. Well, so Uh, can you put on the Dorio slide? Sure. Okay. Uh, so originally venture capital started, um, the story is that uh, William Shockley came up with the transistor. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for it, but then he got really cocky. Um, and he had all these brilliant people. He acquired the best talent in the nation. Um, PhD from MIT, um, Stanford at the time. Um, and they all came to work for him. Uh, but he's such a bad boss that all these great minds were kind of felt under stress working for him. So they, they're they called the Traders 8. They chose to leave him um, and go and start their own company. Um, and what they did is they wrote a letter to this guy called Arthur Rock, who's a Wall Street financier. And they asked him that if they could get some funding to create their own company. And they have this strong IP and the strong knowledge of the uh, industry. And uh, he got the funding. So that was the original. That, that was the beginnings of venture capital. Um, it really didn't speed up until the 90s in the IT revolution because originally venture capital 
um, was very much a long form capital. Um, what happened is that you would invest money and you expected it to, they, they were going to get a core uh, capability and they were able to reap profits for long periods of time. Um, but that changed when the IT revolution hit and that it could be a, a fast way of making a return. And so a venture capital fund became a lot like a hedge fund that just took a lot more risk. So pretty much the way a VC firm uh, runs is they'll make, they, they last around 10 years. Um, the way they work is that they, they focus on outliers and winning with outliers. So pretty much uh, what they'll do is they give each of us about, um, I mean, I'll, I'll like make the figures. Well, I'll just give the same figures. So they'll give us each like a seed round about like 100,000 to a million. Uh, but they only expect one of us to really become like a Facebook. And they know that every single year there's probably only like 10 companies that we should invest in, that they're going to be the big winners. And they focus on these um, multiple uh, high factor returns. Um, if you make less than 15x your original investment as a VC, you're considered a bad VC. Uh, and there's still only like a couple VCs that are known as the really, really good ones. Um, and what they focus now, what they focus on doing nowadays is not just getting you money, they actually focus on helping you build out a team. And in that paper, they actually talked about, we look a lot at the technology, but also the person, because pretty much we're gonna help you grow this company like it's like legit. It's, it's gonna be changing rapidly, uh, and you're gonna have to change the person during each phase of it. And so um, this is a form of capital that has become very popular. Um, if you look into the, I think you have some of the numbers there for how much, how much was raised every year. In terms of funds, I got yeah, it. Billion in 1990, uh, 30 billion in 1999, um, and 2015, 60 billion. So there is kind of like a VC capital bubble, and it's really illogical because um, there's only 10 companies you truly invest in that are going to make these returns. At the same time, though, because it's a really great business or it seems that way, a lot of people are putting in money. Um, so there's bubblish behavior. Uh, and so, a couple questions from that era. Is, uh, what innovation trends and sectors represent the most promising growth areas for VCs in the next few years? Any questions about VC capital? Mm, yeah, I do. It's Lily. Um, so you said that in in the first round or like the um, younger VC capital a few years ago it was more. The expectation was for longer return. Now we've been spoiled with the tech revolution, and people want returns on a two-year, two to five year. Is that reasonable? Uh, more or less. Like, if you're a really great company, you're going to exit in, into an IPO in, less, in about seven years to ten years. So that's yeah. what they're looking for for a return. Can can VC be? Uh, can they do? Can they? Have funds that mix long term and short term? Is that what they're going to have to do? Because you, I see short term and this huge influx. Look, we have excess capital now. Oh. If you say there are only X number of companies that really hit it big in the short term, we have excess capital that's as compared to previous years. So, do you think that VCs are going to have to start paying more attention to long term returns? And is that a more sustainable business model for them? Uh, so, what's happened is it's not so much like VCs in terms of making a return because they, the way a VC fund works is that they'll acquire money from say MIT funds and they need to increase that capital. So a lot of times they can't say, oh, well, we're gonna focus on this thing that's much better. It's gonna be net profitable, but not in terms of money. So it'll be a good for society. Um, that doesn't usually happen. What ends up happening, um, that recently there's been a fund that's like that, that was invested where the investors are like Jack Ma from Alibaba, uh, Bill Gates, I forget the name of it. Right. Breakthrough energy, and they focus on longer time cycles of around 20 years. Um, and also, they focus on having like it's pretty much like the dream team of billionaires on it. Well, and they announced it a year ago, and they've now formed the pool of money, but I have yet to hear about any actual investments. Just so you know. yeah. um, the reason I bring that one up is because it's not so much like they're trying to make huge returns off of the capital, what they're doing is these people that it's, it's, it's a mix of philanthropy and venture capital, calling it patient capital. Yeah, yeah. So related to that, um, so like I'm sure you know that like, there are VC firms that will only do like um, like Series A financing or Series B financing um, or mezzanine financing, and uh, there are firms that will do a mix of that. Um, so at different stages in companies, 
Um, but then you do run into the upper limit where you have groups like the engine are working on where you know Nike Coppers don't want to wait more than like, 15 years or so to sit on a return. So I've heard of like a number of funds, especially in Silicon Valley, that aren't just like solely VC now, but are also like long short equity funds, like more of a hedge fund style combined with VC. So it's sort of like VC's more longer term horizon, like two to five years or whatever. Um, they're willing to wait out for, but also like in the short term playing around with getting some returns that way. So I think that might be a response to how, like to address that problem with what to do with the longer term horizon. It's also just really early to tell, because um, I guess the idea of VGC firms and the IT bill was like, what? Um, so I guess we're probably now slowing down according to this venture capital group. Um, but like, is it kind of hard to see out, you know, these firms are now just starting to pop up who are willing to invest out like uh, past 15, like towards like 20 years? Um, and are we, you know, is it a little bit early for us to say maybe uh, these firms might have more success or less success than the traditional model? Because like, it yes. really is just really new. Um, and they haven't made a single investment. Well, in the percent of VC money, you know, that this represents is small. Yeah. Yeah, just to, to put a few numbers on the table. So venture capital funding in 2015 was 60 billion. Venture capital funding before the Great Recession was about 60 billion as well. So we're sort of back to that number. But when you think about, I mean, after all, right? If growth is driven by technological and related innovation and you've got 19, I got a $19 trillion economy, say, nationwide, right? Is 60, $60 billion is nothing. Right, that's not a lot of money to be banking on what our future growth is going to be. So, you know, I the issue I think Martine shrewdly raised was, you know, we're not on an innovation wave at the moment. We're on the kind of scale up part of the IT wave. It's not the 1990s anymore. VCs really work amazingly when they're right on the cusp of an innovation wave and playing for that very rapid scale up and growth. So Art Rock's investments in Intel, which really, you're absolutely right, Martin, did drive the creation of the West Coast model. Um, you know, that was just at the cusp of the IT wave and the VC firms really rode it. And we're not at, on one of those ways at the moment. So the VC model has gotten much more complicated um, because the number of firms that are actually going to carry the kind of rewards that occur typically in, in a the scale up part, the rapid, fast scale up part of an innovation wave is just slower. Things are slower. We're waiting for the wave, right? And you know, like surfers. And it's um, I think the old model, the Maverick model, will come right back if we get onto one of these waves. But you know, as we've discussed, these are typically forty year long propositions and you can be in, in a long trough before a wave takes off. So that's really the, that's the fundamental question for this industry. On the other hand, maybe there's another way of looking at it, right? Maybe the other way of looking at it is, could you spur waves more rapidly? And is the short-term return model of venture capital a real barrier in our ability to stand up longer, stronger, more enduring innovation waves sooner, right? So there's a couple of ways of looking at this um, that um, you know that I think are intriguing, and we're gonna we're gonna take a dive into venture capital later in the class, kind of look in a little more detail too, with, as you suggested, Matt, about the engine. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna bring up uh, there is one venture capitalist that focuses on longer stage, well, longer time horizons, about forty years. His name is Peter Thiel. Um, actually, the whole idea of like we are in kind of like a technological recession is from him. Um, he talks a lot about how we're not really like increasing our capabilities, and he's famous for having this one quote that it goes something along the lines of "We were promised blank cars, but we got 144 characters." It's one of my favorite quotes, Martin. I was going to use it too. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were promised. So the, the thing is, like, if you look into the 50s and 70s, yeah. well, an easy way to if you look at the comic books, um, if you look at Iron Man and all these like different characters, they they saw this future where you know, energy flying into the air, um, enough water. Uh, we're not focusing on resources and resource wars anymore. Um, 
And what kind of ended up happening is that we have IT wave, but now we are even more pessimistic, right? Um, and so his point of view is more that we we have better things in some sense, but in terms of having these long form kind of te technologies that actually have a huge impact on our society, we haven't had that. It's just really good times for this one technology, um, and that's his main kind of proposition. Mm -hmm. But he does focus on these technologies that are long, longer time frame, and that might actually be a huge opportunity because if you know. $59 billion people, uh, dollars of the capital are focusing on these tenure, um, sexy chat companies, right? Um, like Snapchat, Facebook, uh, Pinterest, um, that really won't have a big impact. And you're one of the investors who's okay, I'll wait 10 more years, but I have these kind of trillion dollar companies that are coming off of my belt. Um, that's a huge opportunity. The, the big thing too is we were talking about entrepreneurs and how the first, um, the, the first inventor usually doesn't capture that value. This is actually an opportunity for maybe the first inventor to capture a lot of value, and then people will focus on that becoming the first wave inventor again. The, the drawback of that too is that say somebody in this room discovers some great technology, but you still have like a semester work at school or something like that, right? Or you want to stay at MIT for like an extra year. Somebody could see the technology and go up to Silicon Valley, raise one million to three million dollars, and they get to scale. Because the Silicon Valley model isn't first to invent, it's first to scale. Um, Facebook was the 15th social network invented pretty much that got like some um, some notoriety. Um, so that's a that's another big thing is that you know maybe that that divide between the first wave and the second wave of invention is going to get either smaller or bigger just because you have these kind of Wall Street hyper rapid effects. Right. So you're driving us, I think, to an important point, Martine, about the venture capital sector as it's organized now. Right. It's really organized for this. Right, that's what it wants, right? It doesn't know what to do with this, right? And it's desperately trying to make this look like this, right? That's kind of where we are. There's a problem with his model, right? It's not, it's not there. And so just as we critique the Merrill Lynch piece for you know, the gap here in longer term patient capital, it turns out that the VC model isn't really helping us where we really need a lot of help, which is more in this kind of territory. Chloe? I wonder if some of that comes from, in this piece especially, there seems to be a lot of obsession of like building the right team, and like all the right stuff will come through, the right billionaires all in the room together, like just a small number of people. And it's probably easier to ask for a lot in a short period of time from people because their like career lifespan is much shorter than lifespan of like technology. So it be, could be easier to look a person in the face and be like, develop this for me right now because you, you know, your career is like 20 years long. Not your career, but like that billionaire in that point in life. So maybe that's why like their current model is more suited for the fast growth when actually they're in right. the Yeah, so I mean, Martha was pushing us, and Martine, you mentioned it as well, this whole Gates is organized, this new group that wants to deal with exactly this problem. They want to start dealing with some of this stuff, not just trying to focus on this, right, in order to get an energy innovation wave going. So that may be big enough to be a different model. I don't know. Um, it's not 60 billion, and it's a long way away from it, but he is shaking down people with a lot of money. So, Bill and Martin, isn't the VC model working just fine for the VC firms? I mean, Lily mentioned, hey, there's more capital out there. I'm not sure that's true. I think it's, I think. Yeah. Aren't they doing yeah, it's buy? fine. Yeah. As long as all we want is software and right. biotech, okay, exactly. it's no, great. I just wanted to check on that. Right, though. it's great. It's fabulous. And some services sectors. Media and entertainment are good, too. Right. But if the society wants some other stuff, right, then we got a serious problem on our hands. The energy solution for the world. Right. Because energy is a huge loser in the current venture capital market. Yeah, I mean, another uh, thing to consider too is that these institutions, they're more like institutions now. Like, there's only really five that matter, right? Like uh, Sequoia Capital, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is one of the top ones. Um, uh, what's it called? There's John Edson. Doors. Uh, John Doors is, what, KP? Um, so yeah, they're kind of like the MITs and Harvards. So like, there's really like, if you're, also if you're getting investment, you want it from one of the top ones because you have to get multiple rounds of funding. So if you get your first round and the investor is, is it, doesn't matter or isn't that important, it's going to make it so much difficult for the ones that matter 
in the future. Um, but another thing too is that Silicon Valley, which is a cool thing, is like they've come up with all these ideas of how to like structure teams and make innovation, um, and how they focus a lot on disruptive business models. So what might be interesting is if somebody who focuses on like a harder industry, like the technology, the, the energy sector. Um, right now we could say that there are a lot like the early telegraph lines that they're everywhere, right? But if somebody focuses on like building like the mobile phone for energy, or it's something that's very modular, you have these disruptive angles with the technology. And so the I think the top like fusion startups right now, they're focusing on like something that's like the size of a truck, a reactor that's mm -hmm. mobile and stuff like that. But you probably know a lot better than I do. Yeah, that's Lockheed Martin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lockheed Martin's is, is indoor. I'm talking about uh, Helion. Oh. That's the one that Y Combinator or Sam Altman invested in. Even Y Combinator is only two years, though. All right, so I'm going to push us to do a few. Why don't you give us a few comments on Schultz, and we'll close out the session. Okay, yeah, I wanted to, to link uh, Schultz to this idea, too, because mm -hmm. should the government be a VC fund? Should they be focusing on, oh, let's pick the winners and the losers? Um, when they're not really... Uh, they're inherently, that's not their nature. Um, and generally, you're looking for the welfare of society and these kind of uh, market, these areas of market failure. Um, another big aspect, too, is like, um, they've done better. Well, Schultz's main point is that economies have done better when the government gives a supportive role. Uh, and he does talk about a lot about Japan. I think another factor to consider for Japan, and also South Korea, because um, I don't think he brought up in his favor, but his ideas kind of align with that is that their population periods were in a certain way. Um, usually, you can you hit into these industrial high growth areas when you have a lot of young people and very few older people. Uh, and that's why they kind of die off very quickly. So that might be a hidden factor that he didn't consider at this point of view. Um, but so, yeah, is it this idea of do we create the supportive environment or do we focus on uh, industries? I think it also might have been Jorgensen in the last, in the last week's class where he talked this, about this idea of specific cities that focus on certain industries. That was very interesting, uh, especially uh, contrasting with this point of view, where we make it easier to innovate on certain areas in certain cities, and you develop the capabilities of a city, um, because cities tend to last longer. Well, cities tend to have longer lasting effects where people stay there. That was pretty interesting. That's funny. I, would, I kept thinking completely different things while I was reading the Schultz piece. Um, I kept thinking or wondering, would he be writing? I didn't look up any of his later papers or, or pieces, but I kept on thinking, would he be writing the same thing if he wrote it today or five years ago? Because he keeps on, and I kept thinking, oh my gosh, Schultz is the reason we have the president we have today. He keeps on telling everyone we're not deindustrializing. Don't worry, we're not deindustrializing. But we really were, weren't we? And so, <laughs> granted, all of my economic knowledge comes from Freakonomics, so, but, <laughs> so I, they, yeah, wasn't this a pretty popular view? We're, we're not deindustrializing, or even if we are, don't worry, because the jobs are going to be replaced by the technology that we're developing, and so don't worry, don't worry, and we really let a lot of the, the industry here get away from us and to other countries, and so I, I just think he would change his tune if he were writing it today. You know, you raise a very interesting point, Lily. Schultz is writing in 1983. Solo doesn't get the Nobel Prize until 1987. So growth economics doesn't, we were talking, Beth and I were talking a bit, a bit about this before class, but growth economics doesn't really lock in until, you know, really we start to see what's happening in the 1990s. That's when it's, you can't ignore growth theory, right? You see it right in front of you. So Schultz is out of, in a way, he's out of classical economics. He keeps pointing us to Japan's success story being the national savings rate, right? Solo says, you know, it's useful, but that's not the driver, right? It's this technological-related innovation. So in a way, you can see Schultz, just as you suggest, as a dialogue within different stages of economics thinking, right? And Schultz, in, way, in many ways, is certainly in the neoclassical and early in a way, earlier classical economics thinking about growth before new growth theory develops from people like Solo and, and, uh, and Romer. So that's part of what he's saying here. But I do think that his point about the difficulty of the political system to operate in a sophisticated technology realm, I think that's very real, right? So every time we kind of 
and you know, I'm guilty of this periodically, every time we want to expand the governmental role and push it further down the pipeline, Schultz always stands as a warning for me about the complexity of how the political process is going to wrestle with this. And the system that the, the reward system and the political system is not the same reward system that technology stand up necessarily needs. So I have your point, I think it is <coughs> that mentions like if this were a problem, these would be some solutions like unemployment compensation, relocation assistance, training. But he doesn't and like at the time it was a problem. So it's like we can recognize solutions to potential problems, but we don't seem to recognize the problem when it's arising so that we can implement the solutions. So, Martina, closing thought for us on Schultz? I mean, I, I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, just, it's, ha this, these kind of growth words are very tricky for the government to focus on and also to do it well. Um, but having some kind of uh, function in the innovation space is also important to have. So, it's really like being supportive of the economic environment, but if you get too close, you'll burn yourself in terms of the complexity. Good summary. All right, I want to thank our three discussion leaders for getting us off to such a good start. Good work, team. You set a model for us, set a high threshold. Um, I think now our class, is, the, the participation is pretty well settled. I think we've got a great size. I think this is going to be, I can just tell from the discussion today, it's going to be terrific. You guys are going to be great. And I think we got to have a lot of fun. So I'm, I had a good time last week, but I'm really reassured about where this is going. So thank you all for participating. So I'll see you on the 28th, and I will put out a longer-term list of discussion leaders in the interim. <laughs>